Okay, so I already passed out one document, and so I'd like to go over it, and then I'm going to pass out another document. So I have some more detailed instructions on the essay that's due. What day is it due? Tuesday. Yeah, I almost said Monday. What time is it due? No, it's not due at 120. Yeah, it's due in the second class. It's due at 220. I'm not suggesting you come to, the, come to read the college and ditch the first hour to stay out on the picnic table and finish your paper. I'm not suggesting that. What I want to do is review some of this. So this is the final version. It's not talking about that essay draft that we've already turned in. You need I didn't pass out enough? See, I thought in my lifetime I've passed out plenty of times. But Okay, don't laugh at that joke. In any case, so you can either turn in a hard copy that's typed, or you can turn in a hard copy that's handwritten, and I'm totally okay with that. But depending on how good your handwriting is, you may have to write really slow so it's legible. I have terrible handwriting, so I tend to write it just in capital letters, and then I try to write really slow. So if you also have an issue with handwriting, you need to take into account how long it's going to take to write it out by hand. That's okay. No points off as long as I can read it. Okay. You can also email me the document, but last time I did this, I had people emailing me the document at 7 o'clock in the morning the day it was due, and then class would go, get over, and they would say, I emailed it, and I would say, yes, I saw it on my email. I haven't looked at it yet. And then after class is over, I try to go open it up, and something's wrong, and I can't open it. So if you want to do it electronically, you need to send it to me, and I need to be able to open it. And if I can't open it, then it's, and, and I, and it's after it's due, that means it's now late. And what I try to do is when I, when I come in on Tuesday, anybody that sent me an email, I'm going to try to open it, and I'm going to let you know. But what happens if I send you an email back, and you don't check your email in the middle of the day on Tuesday, and you show up, and you say, hey, did you get my email? Yeah, but I couldn't open it. And you don't have your computer, and you can't send me another version. So I'm going to suggest that maybe even if you email it, you print it out and bring in a hard copy. Or bring it in on a USB drive also. But you're going to have to loan me that USB drive, at least till after class so I can copy it onto my computer. Does anybody have any questions about an electronic submission? I'm not trying to convince you not to do it. I'm just telling you, i got to have a copy of it either on the computer and I can read it or a hard copy. Of it. Otherwise, it's not on time. So the final version, you're going to need a title page. I'll talk about that here shortly. And then the main chunk of it is an introduction paragraph, the main body of the paper, and then a conclusion paragraph. I'm trying to make this as simple as I possibly can. And then you're going to do what's called a bibliography, and I'm going to talk about that. That's going to take its own page. So if you want to write notes on this, that might be a good idea. The bibliography is its own page. The bibliography is its own page, and the title page is its own page. Now, that introduction paragraph and the body and the conclusion, I haven't counted out the words, but it's only going to take one or two pieces of paper if you type in small letters or write with very small handwriting. So it's not a big paper. It might only be five or six paragraphs, maybe seven or eight, with three sentences a paragraph. That's all right. All right. And then the last thing, which I haven't told you before, is when you turn in this piece of the, the, the actual essay, the bibliography page, that's the page where you tell me where you got all your information. I have instructions on what that bibliography page is going to look like. And I'm going to pass this out here pretty soon, not quite yet. But you're actually going to, when you use this and you say, aha, I have a book, use the same exact format and write the information, on this piece of paper, you're actually going to circle it to tell me that you used that to type up or to write up that bibliography page. So you're going to end up turning this in with your paper. My hope is that you staple it. If you don't staple it, you'll need to write your name on it. Don't write master. That's me. I am the master. Just so we're clear here. So we'll get to the bibliography page, but that's going to be its own page. So first off, we're going to start with the title page. You can see the title page. I don't care how you put that information on there, but you need the name of the class. It's Flight 102. You need my name. I typically put instructor and then a colon, John Johnson. You need to make sure your name is on it. Please include your last name. The date it's due. So Tuesday is September Is it the 4th for sure? 
unless it's the 5th. So that means no. Whatever the whatever Tuesday's date is, I'm sure you'll be able to dig up your calculator. And then write the, the SA. This is on after an aircraft. So write the name of the aircraft or the spacecraft. I think uh, Luis is going to do Apollo 11. So that's going to be on there. All right. Then on the next piece of paper, it's going to, we're going to start off with the introduction paragraph. Somewhere in that paragraph, we need to mention those five important things that's going to be in the rest of the paper. Like, for instance, I don't know what Lewis is doing on the Apollo 11, but he's probably going to say the Apollo 11 aircraft, spacecraft, is important because, one, it was the first uh, aircraft to land, spacecraft to land on the moon and return with humans, and it was super awesome because it weighed 300,000 pounds before it took off, and it was also super trick because it went 30,000 miles an hour to get to the moon, and, you know, or whatever the five things are that you think is important, Luis. You're pretty much going to need to say all five of those in that paragraph. Not, not too many details, just maybe one sentence on each one. And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to take off a lot of points, but if my paper is on the B-52, don't say that. I know it's on the B-52. Don't say this paper is about the B-52. You would say B-52 was an awesome airplane due to five major things. The one, most important of those five is that Mr. Johnson flew on it when he was in the Air Force, and I'm trying to impress Mr. Johnson. Remember, the second most important thing is that they're now all painted green, and green is my favorite color. And it's, it's also totally tricked because it'll carry 51 bombs of 750 pounds each of conventional weapons, carry up to 24 nuclear warheads, which is, also, which is now number four. And number five is, uh, is uh, I want to fly B-52s when I grow up. You know, I, don't worry, it'll still be there. All right, so right below the introduction paragraph is the body. You're probably, it doesn't have to be five paragraphs long, but, but if you did it that way, you're probably going to work out pretty good. One paragraph on each one of those things. So if you say the B-52 is awesome because it could carry 51 bombs that weigh 750 pounds, that might be a paragraph where you talk about what those bombs are. And then if another thing about that B-52 is awesome because it will carry 24 nuclear weapons, you might say, well, it will carry 24 nuclear weapons, and here's the five different kinds of nukes that you can put on it. So probably the body is probably going to be about five paragraphs because you're going to talk about the details of each of those five paragraphs. And then the conclusion is effectively a rehash of the first paragraph. The B-52 is the most awesome airplane in the world because it can carry nukes and it can carry conventional, regular, you know, regular explosive bombs and green. It's, the most of them are green, and that's always been my favorite color. And I'm trying to suck up to Mr. Johnson. And I'm not making sense here. So that may, that's only going to take about a page and a half. The body, the 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 introduction paragraph, body with several paragraphs, and then the conclusion. Okay, and then another piece of paper is the bibliography page. So that's going to have at least, it can be more, but it's got to have at least five different places where you found information. They don't all have to be off of the Internet. On the contrary, they could all be out of books, or they could be some of one or the other. They cannot have more than one of your references be from Wikipedia. It's okay if one is. It's okay if you don't use Wikipedia at all. That's not mandatory. But if I look on there and I see that you found all of your data from Wikipedia, your research grade is going to plummet really, really low. You need to find somewhere else. Is anybody doing their thing on a B-52? Did somebody pick a B-52? What's that? I convinced them out of it? Oh, okay. Because I got a really, I got a dictionary in my office that's got an article about a B-52. And that would be one reference. I'd loan somebody that book. All right, nobody picked the B-52. All right, so now what I want to talk about, what I think I, there is no prerequisite for this class to have done, write, written a lot of English papers with bibliography. So I understand that for some people you don't have a lot of practice doing that. So I'm going to try really hard to make this as simple and easy as possible. And so I want to do that right now. 
course, the problem is if you didn't come to school today, and we have three people absent right now, they're going to be a little bit unhappy. But tomorrow I'm going to go with them. So this is the bibliography guide. You're going to turn this in. You can take notes on it. You can say, turn this in with the essay if you want. Well, let's just say you pick a book. You find a book. Look at this very first four different ways to do it. This is an example of four different books. So let's say you found an inside a book about B-52s. This is how you would do it. You put the last name of the person that, that wrote it and then their first name. The 2002 or 2004, that's the year the book was published. And then the title of the book, Friendships Through I Am. And then you put the page numbers that you use. So if it's a 300-page book and you only used information off of pages 278, 279, 280, you just put 278 through 280. Does that make sense? So that right there, that, that part that you would circle, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to circle one. So if you use a book, you're going to need to search one of these. And then this is the way your bibliography page needs to, to read. It needs to look like this, except you're going to put in the information on the book you've got. But this is telling you what information needs to go in there. And this is the problem I found last time I taught this class, is people aren't used to doing it, so I'm trying to teach you how to do it. Now, how many people... Okay, then you don't have to pay any attention to this. So let's go to the very last piece of paper. The very last piece of paper. Because all the rest of this, these five, six pages, is how to quote Internet sources. So, for instance, everybody except Rodrigo is probably going to do a Wikipedia page. So there's how to do it. So you're going to end up circling that part under wikis. And you're going to make your entry look like that, except you're going to write in there, you know, B-52. Peru, Arahuay. Now, you notice there's a little ND right there? That means no data. So you might want to write that in somewhere, no data. Like you might find something on a website, and it doesn't tell you what year it was done. You notice the example above it, that's, or the two examples above it, that's where the year goes. And you can it, they don't list a date. So that ND is for no data or no date. Yes? I don't know what easy bib is. I think that's awesome. So where, what's the name of that web page? Okay, I vote for that. I accept. I officially accept Easy Bib. How do you? How do you? How is it? So you paste the URL, you paste the link into it, and it gives you a bibliography, and you just cut and paste it into your paper, or you write it down if you're doing it by hand. Does it just do it on the internet source sources, right? Yes. Score. Capital S, capital C, capital O, capital R, capital E. The intent of this is to not make you suffer and cry at home in your bedroom at 3 in the morning the day this is due, okay? It may work out that way for you, but that's not my intent. The intent here of this research, of this bibliography, is because when in real life, and not just in college, but in real life, you need to be able to tell somebody, here is where I got this information. And you can't just say, I got it on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is easy because you can search Wikipedia. You can type B-52 and there's one thing about B-52s. But if it's on some other website, you need to put all this other information on there. And being able to do research is a required skill set in this class, and I have to grade it. It does, but you got to, hey, you're going to have to type something in. Yeah, you just have to. All right. All right, I highly recommend you write easybib.com and what the heck, write it down on this piece of paper. And I'll tell you what, on the bottom of this paper, I want you to write easybib.com. I want everybody to write easybib.com. 
And if you use that, I want you to circle it. If this is if I, if, if Jaron is making it too easy for you, don't use easy bib. If you want me to say you can't use easy bib, just stand up and walk out of class right now. Okay, fine, you can use easy bib. When I went to school, when I was your age, we were still writing on stone tablets. Okay. So, guess what you could do tonight? You could get a draft of this put together, even if you just slap it together and print it and bring it to me tomorrow and or email it to me. And then tomorrow, here's my thought, is that when we're in the next room flying the simulator, I'll sit in front if you email it to me. I'm going to print it out. I'll write on my red pen, and by the time you I'll give you my so I'm giving you a screaming deal here. You're not turning it in for points. All you're doing is handing it to me, and I can say, no, this is baloney. Don't write that, or write this, or your bibliography looks like you did it on easybib.com. That's awesome, or no, it looks terrible. Or you wrote, my paper is on the B-52. How many people are going to say that? Nobody, because nobody's doing it on the B-52. All right, so if you have a day planner that you're writing it in there right now, send a draft to Mr. Johnson tonight, or print it out, or write it by hand. Okay, we got 21 minutes till class is over. What are we going to do for the next 21 minutes? We already talked about the essay. We're going to do Section 4. This is Chapter 4 out of the textbook. It's on World War One, and this is Part 1. Chris? Pardon me? Okay, I can never mind. I'm really good at that. So, we're talking about World War I, and I have to apologize. I made a terrible error. I made a terrible error. I was looking up stuff from World War I today, and I realized that I had the wrong number. World War I. States entered the war. In November of eight years, you're wrong because I told you you were wrong. I apologize. I accept my apology. War ended. War. The armistice started. We they stopped shooting bullets in I think it was November of eighteen, and they signed the treaty in early nineteen. So some people might say the war was over in late eighteen. Some people might say the war was over in in early nineteen. I'm going to say the war was over in late nineteen eighteen. The United States was in about the last 18 months. We entered the war in April of 17, and it went into November, 18 months. So the United States was in it for about the last 18 months. But 14 to 17, I mean 14 to 18, so it went for about four years. So I, I, if you don't accept my apology and you hold it against me the rest of my life, I will somehow survive. In any case, airships. That is, we're talking dirigibles. We're used as a bomber for the very first time in the beginning of the war in 1914, because the war actually did start in 1914. Zeppelin made the dirigibles. Same company that ended up making the Hindenburg. In fact, Zeppelin reformed, and they're actually making Zeppelins again, and Goodyear has actually bought a Zeppelin. It's, I believe it's a semi-rigid. It's not a blimp. It's a semi-rigid dirigible. And there is a picture of a World War I Zeppelin. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, if you look at a dirigible and the width or the diameter or the circumference, the diameter of the Zeppelin, if it's a constant one and it's not bulgy in the middle, it's probably pre-World War I or World War I. Not until the end of World War I did anybody start building what we look like now, and it's bulgy in the middle. Like if you looked at the pictures of the Hindenburg, it, it doesn't. This looks like a cigar because the side of the size of the cigar is constant. The downside, as Jared mentioned, are threefold or twofold. Enemy aircraft is one of them. It goes slow. If you know, it's going 60, 70 miles an hour on a good day. 
And the airplane, what if the airplane can go 80, 90, or 100 miles an hour? That means it can't get away. And it's a big target. It's hard to miss. Now, maybe you won't catch one of the hydrogen bags inside on fire, but if you get that bullet just right and there's enough friction or it hits a piece of aluminum on the inside and has a spark and it catches the skin of the blimp or the dirigible and that skin has aircraft dope made out of nitrates, you'll be able to catch it on fire and probably you will kill most of the people on the aircraft. That's not your intent maybe to kill everyone. Your intent is to destroy the vehicle. The problem is the vehicle's full of people. The other issue is weather. The other issue is weather. Zeppelins, and that's why you don't see Zeppelins flying around a lot, is they're, they're not good near thunderstorms. The wind blows them around like crazy. And that's still the case today. They weren't very good at bombing. They tried to bomb at high altitude. They tried to bomb at night. And they, when I say they weren't very good, they weren't very accurate. I mean, it was done on all sides. I think... Uh, Germany and Great Britain and Italy, at a minimum, maybe even France, I can't recall, actually used Zeppelins to drop bombs, but it didn't do much damage. What they were good at was reconnaissance over the ocean. And when I say reconnaissance, I'm talking about observation, flying around over the ocean looking for the enemy ships. Because one of the great things about Zeppelins is they can stay up in the air for a long, long time, like a day or two or three or four. You take enough water... You take enough food, you take enough gasoline or diesel. I think these were gasoline back then. And you can stay up for days. Because if you want to burn low, a low amount of fuel, just turn off all but one of your engines. Because it doesn't need the engines to run to generate lift. All right, the next topic, World War I, are kite balloons. Essentially, balloons on a string. Well, actually, they were on ropes. So we'll talk about balloons on ropes. Kite balloons were generally used for observation, just like Napoleon used balloons to go up and have somebody up there and holler and scream down. But, of course, now they had, they had telephone lines. They didn't have to use telegraph and go use Morse code, da 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 Now they could have telephone lines, and somebody up in the balloon could say, oh, yeah, I'm seeing where, you're, where the howitzers are hitting or where the guns are hitting. Go to the right 500 feet. Or go farther 500 feet, because that's where the tanks are, or whatever. Oh, actually, there were not a lot of tanks in World War One. excuse me. So that's what they did. They could, tell, they could tell where the enemy was, so you knew where to attack, and they could direct the artillery. Here's a picture of a kite balloon. You'll notice, it's, although it's kind of inflated, it's got a kind of a fin to it. So that way, it'll always point in a certain direction. That way, it's not always spinning around. And, of course, there's that poor schmuck in it. Because if you're sitting up there, let's just say for fun, you go up to a thousand feet. Is it very hard to see you from an enemy airplane? No. Is it hard to see you? Well, I guess you're probably far enough away that they can't shoot you with bullets. That's the downside of these balloons is the enemy aircraft could see you and come and shoot you. I hate that. So they generally gave these gentlemen parachutes. And barrage balloons are a specific type of a kite balloon. And barrage balloons were, didn't have people in them. There's two R's in barrage. And no, they were not built in a garage. Because when I first saw it, I thought, oh, yeah, that's, that, that was like, that's, a, that's Barry's garage. They were built in Barry's garage, and they shortened it to barrage. So here's some barrage balloons. There's nobody in them, but they're holding up ropes and nets. Because now if you had something really important at the bottom down here by the ground, it would make it a lot harder for an enemy airplane to strafe or to drop bombs accurately. So barrage balloons with nets or ropes were, to, were a defensive system to keep it, make it hard for enemy airplanes to attack whatever was on the ground. And they even used barrage balloons in World War II. If you look at pictures and video about D-Day, where in 1944, was it June of 44? June of 44, when uh, the Allies invaded France from England, they put up barrage balloons so the enemy aircraft couldn't strafe the troops on the beach. All right, let's talk about airplanes. We talked about the, all that lighter-than-air stuff. Now we're going to talk about heavier-than-air. 
the beginning, you might even underline the word beginning, at the beginning of World War I, the biggest use of airplanes was reconnaissance. Let's go fly and see where the bad guys are. We'll come back and tell the generals, and they can change what direction they're marching the troops. Oh, yeah, they're on the other side of the river. Okay, great. Let's send our artillery to the other side of the river, and let's have our troops march over there and see if they can shoot bullets. So they see where every, the bad guys were. They come back land and report. So they were reconnaissance. They didn't have a lot of power. They couldn't maneuver really well. And most of them were biplanes. What I find interesting about low power, limited maneuverability, I was actually watching and reading some stuff about World War I airplanes today. And our Cessna 152 out there, you know, it'll carry about 500 pounds of people, and it'll go about 100 miles an hour, and it's got 100, and I think that's got 108 horsepower. And it will maneuver, but it's not that great. That airplane is about as good as one of the better fighters of World War I. Well, remember, if the, if the beginning of World War I was actually 1914, that's only 11 years after the Wright brothers had their first successful man-sustained, controlled, powered flight. 11 years. That's not a long time. All right. One of the bigger problems is they couldn't fire straight ahead because the bullets would hit the pr propeller, and most of the propellers were made out of wood, and it would destroy the propeller. So they had to mount them cockeyed, pointing off to the side, or they had to put somebody in the back seat with a gun, or sometimes they put the engine in the back, and they had the gunner sitting in front of the pilot. But it was really hard to shoot down other airplanes at the beginning of World War I. The first time anybody dropped a bomb out of an airplane in a war was at the beginning of World War I. Now, they didn't have big old honking bombers at the beginning of World War I, but by the end of World War I, they had two- and four-engine bombers that could carry hundreds and hundreds of pounds, and they'd have a pilot and a navigator and a couple of gunners, a bombardier maybe. I guess a pilot. And they didn't have navigators. They had bombardiers. It's the guy that pushes the switch and makes the bombs fall out. Anybody ever done that? Am I the only one? Okay. I never killed anybody. Although we used to drop bombs on this island in the Pacific, north of Guam. So I probably killed pelicans and geckos and a fish or two. Anybody ever been to Guam? Anybody ever heard of Guam? It's kind of in the news these days. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk about Guam in the news after class. All right. So what got better? If uh, World War I started in 1914... And the shooting stopped in November of 18. And we say that this war, therefore, lasted for four years. And the U.S. was in the war for the last 18 months. Does anybody know, just for fun, who was the president of the United States in 1917 when the U.S. went entered the war? I'll give you a hint. What are the, no, no, that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He wasn't the president until the 1930s. I'll give you a hint. His first name and his last name both started with W. So when you think W, W1, it was Woodrow Wilson. You guys, no, they, don't, they don't teach you this in high school? That's how you remember who the president of the United States was at the beginning of World War I. Because it, it was WW, Woodrow Wilson. It's hard to spell Woodrow. Does anybody know anybody that's named Woodrow? You think they called him Woody for short? Not when he was the president, probably. But it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, Christopher was right about World War II. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was the president of the United States at the beginning of World War II. All right, so what are the things? I've got a giant list of things that got way, 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 way better during World War I. And why did they get way, 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 way better? Because lots of governments on both sides of the war we're spending lots and lots of money paying aircraft manufacturers and engine manufacturers to make better airplanes and better engines and better machine guns. And they figured out how to shoot straight through the propeller and not damage the propeller. They did lots of stuff. They learned how to drop not just a bomb or two. You all right? Okay. 
So the engines got more and more powerful. The airplanes could maneuver better. You could turn faster. You, you could pull straight up faster. You could turn and dive faster. And that's great. If you're trying to shoot the other airplane, you want to be able to turn faster than they are. So you could, they got to, they could, they, they built airplanes that could maneuver better. By the end of World War I, they had airplanes that had radios in them. Awesome, you could fly over enemy territory and radio in their position. They didn't have to wait until you got back. You could also talk to other airplanes, which is also very nice. And then, of course, at the beginning of World War I, the first person to shoot a gun out of an airplane had a rifle. I'm not kidding. He had a rifle. It turns out, oh, there's the bad guy. He tries to shoot the other airplane with a rifle. A nearly pointless. It probably made him feel better. At least he was shooting bullets. Yay. So, machine guns. And when I say machine guns, I'm talking about fully automatic. Does anybody know the difference between a semi-automatic weapon and a fully automatic weapon? Anybody besides Jared? What is it? Oh, you're very close. You're very close, Jordan. Yeah, that's right. A semi-automatic, you have to pull the trigger for every bullet. They have modified some fully automatic weapons. Shoots three. Because the military's figured out that's a really good way to go. It's just pull Fully automatic. as it can until either A, you let go of the trigger, or B, you run out of bullets, run out of uh, ammunition. So when I, when I say machine gun, I'm talking a fully automatic. So when the pilot pulls the trigger, the machine gun goes, <laughs> I mean, it makes a better noise than that, but the pilot has to let go of the trigger. So that means you can get lots of bullets flying through the air trying to shoot down the other aircraft. They started trying to figure out, you know what, what, I'm not making this up. They literally put a machine gun on top of the airplane in front of the pilot, and it was shooting through the propeller, but the propeller was made out of wood, so they bolted metal plates to the propeller. So every now, when the propeller flew through, most of the bullets got through, 80, 90 percent of the bullets got through, plate and bounced off. Now that's, no, they didn't bounce back because it wasn't flat. It was at an angle, yeah. So it bounced off. It didn't hit the airplane. The downside is the airplane, the propeller, a lot of energy, and it was like pounding on it with a hammer. What do you think happens to a piece of wood if you sit there with a big sledgehammer and you just stand there and you just hit that wood? After a while, it's going to crack and it's going to break. So this was not the best solution. But it was better than trying to fly, si to fly sideways. Then they came out. A guy named Einstein, he built some airplanes on the German side, some, some single wing, some, some monoplane, and he figured out how to connect the machine gun firing, the trigger mechanism, to the engine. So as the engine rotated around and the prop was out of the way, the machine gun would fire, and then when the prop was just about to get into the way, the machine gun would stop just for a split second. The propeller would go by, and then the machine gun would kick in. So all the pilot had to do was just hold the trigger down, and the machine gun would stop, let the propeller go by, and kick in. So it would be like, eh, 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 eh. I mean, it was way faster than that. You probably couldn't hear it. Do you guys like my machine gun sounds? I have grenade sounds. They're not as good as the machine gun sounds. And they also took care of it. They also finally started, hey, you know, these descriptions, the pilots come back. They try to describe things not as good as a camera. So they'd start taking cameras and take a second person just to take the pictures. Remember, cameras back in the 19-teens were harder to operate than your cell phone camera. So more advancements. I got a list. There's 28 different things that got better during World War I. So on the test, it'll go something like this. Name 30 of the 28 improvements in aviation that occurred during World War I. And two of them you will all, all get wrong, because there won't be any answer. But I'm sure everyone will remember the other 28. Okay. Prior to the beginning of World War I, there was no such thing as a bomber, an airplane that was solely designed to take off, carry lots of bombs, fly to the bad guys, drop the bombs, turn around and come back. 
But during World War I, people designed bigger and larger and heavier airplanes with more than one engine. And they built bombers designed to carry bombs. They also had to aim the bombs. Because I'm telling you, looking out the window and say, ready, ready, go, those bombs are not very accurate. Ask me sometime at break time. And I'll tell you about trying to drop bombs out of a B-52 with the pilot looking out the window. It's not very accurate at all, especially when you're going 400 miles an hour. But even if you're only going 100 miles an hour, it's still very inaccurate. So a bomb sight is something that a bombardier could look through, and I usually had a glass lens with lines on it like a, t like a, like a scope on a rifle, and they would aim it down at the ground and adjust it. And when the target came up, they'd hit the pickle switch push the button with their hand, and the bombs would fall out. So they invented that in World War I. They also started making multi-engine airplanes. Multi-engine airplanes. When was the last time you looked and saw an airliner that only had one engine? Probably didn't. It's because, and you don't have to write this down, but according to Federal Aviation Regulation Part 121, which governs scheduled airlines, it says, doesn't say you have to have two engines. It says, if one engine quits, you still have to be able to maintain flight on the remaining engine. But you've got to have at least two engines. And most of the multi-engine airplanes were bombers. They also invented strafing. And when I say strafing, that's where you fly close to the ground and you want to shoot people on the ground. And you aim the airplane at the ground, at the people, and you pull the trigger, and you go, <laughs> while you're flying low to the ground, and then you pull up, and then you turn around, and you strafe the other direction. <laughs> and you're trying to think. Now, you don't have to kill people. You can strafe trains and trucks. Has anybody ever done a strafing run? Yeah, me neither. All right. They also invented big guns on the ground that would shoot up into the air to try to shoot down the airplanes. In other words, anti-aircraft artillery. In fact, there's an abbreviation for it. It's called AAA. Also, if you watch enough World War II movies with bombers in them, they might call them ACAC guns. And when the thing blows up, and they, they made them, I don't know if they made these in World War I, but in World War II, the shell would come up to the airplanes and they would explode at a certain altitude. And the shrapnel coming off of the bombs, and if it hit the airplane, it was called flak. I hate it when I get hit by flak. You ever been hit by a piece of sharp metal that's going 300 miles an hour? Yeah, me neither. I don't think I would like it. I really don't think I would like it. I'll tell you what, we're going to stop right there. So tomorrow is Friday. You know what to do about Friday, yes? I highly recommend that tonight you work on any kind of a draft at all on your essay for me to look at tomorrow would be way, way better than no thing for me to work, look at at all. So class is dismissed. Question?